Hi, I'm James Patrick with Big Picture. I'd like to introduce you to a man named Martin Armstrong. He's one of the most interesting and colorful figures in the world of international finance, currency markets, and economic forecasting. He became at one point the largest institutional financial advisor in the world, overseeing several trillion dollars. In this interview, he discusses with us his thoughts on taxation, if cryptocurrencies are a scam of the central bankers and the government to control us, and his views in the whole COVID period and where this is all headed. He tells us how he got into finance, starting at a small gold shop and fascinated by the historical spikes in gold price. And he researched and discovered, and this led him to develop financial forecasting tools to predict market movements, macro trends, almost to the day. Let's hear what this financial legend has to say. I got a, a job in a gold store for when I was uh, uh, a teenager just to, to make some money to go to Europe. You could buy gold, but it just had to be coins. And as long as they were dated before 1947, it was fine. So, um, you know, people would buy rolls of $20 gold pieces and stuff like that back then. Uh, Mexico used to do re-strikes. They were always dated 1947 so they could sell them to Americans. Uh, Austria-Hungary did re-strikes of coins dated 1908 so they could sell them. Um, so it was, you know, there was a viable gold market before gold was technically legal in 1975. Uh, 1975 just allowed them to start trading futures. So that was pretty much it. Actually, in high school, um, a teacher brought in an old film, a black and white film with Cary Grant. It was called The Toast of New York, I believe. Uh, and it was about the Panic of 1869. Jim Fisk tried to corner the gold market back then. Um, and there was a scene in there where he's reading the price of gold off the ticker tape. And he turns to his girlfriend and, Josie, gold's at $162. You know, I got them all or something like that. That bothered me. I was like, wait a minute, how could it be $162 in 1869 when it's $35 today? Um, so first I thought it was just a movie. Uh, but then it bothered me. I went down to the library, looked in the microfilm, and there it was, $162. So that, was, that, that, I would say, disrupted my thinking where I was being taught everything was linear, and it was just wrong. Then you went to physics class, and the professor said, nothing's random. Uh, and then you went to economics class, and they said, oh, everything's random. Uh, so we can manipulate it. It was their own self-interest, basically. So they didn't deny that a cycle existed. It was just that they said it was random. In doing some research, I came across a Wall Street Journal article from 1907, maybe 1908, something like that. And it had a list of, of financial panics from 1683 to 1907. And I <clears throat> it covered a period of time of 24 years, and I just took the list. And there were 26 events. And I've divided that into the 224 and came up with 8.6. Uh, I thought that was just an average. Uh, I didn't think it was precise or something like that. Uh, and it turned out it was. And the more I investigated it, uh, fortunately, that list of panics was global. So 1683 was a panic in Vienna when the Ottoman Empire uh, laid siege to Vienna, which was the financial capital of the world at the time. Everything's in, involved in it. Uh, climate, uh, war, uh, you name it, everything has an impact. What's really behind this carbon hysteria? <laughs> Basically, they use it as the excuse that uh, we need a one world government, the United Nations, because no single nation can fight climate change. I mean, it, it's just, it's complete nonsense. All you have to do is go through history and look at it uh, when <clears throat> the climate turns warm or it turns cold. Uh, when it, it was cold, you had all the people from the North invade the South. They called them the Sea Peoples and they wiped out the Bronze Age. They, you know, defeated every civilization other than the Egypt, you know, Egypt. They were the only ones that survived it. It picked October 19th, 1987 crash. 
the 07 peak was exactly the day of the show or high in the index in, in 2007. Um, 2015.75 uh, <clears throat> was the exact day uh, Putin invaded Syria. 9-11 uh, took exactly right on the day. Turning point was 1933. Hitler comes to power, but so did FDR and so did Mao. Uh, so you had major political changes. Uh, what I did begin to under, understand about it is that if you move the economy in one direction, you get political change. I think it's, it's a much bigger situation. And being an international hedge fund manager, I saw it globally. In the 80s, all the, you know, everybody was there in uh, Geneva because that's where all the OPEC money was. Then it moves to 1989 to Tokyo. Um, that's where all the money and talent moved over there. Then when Tokyo peaks, uh, where did it go? It went to Southeast Asia. Then you end up with the Southeast Asian the currency crisis in 97, you know. And then uh, it goes off to, uh, you know, went off to Moscow and then Moscow collapses in 98. It's, so it, it capital concentrates. Um, it, it's, everybody gets on the same trade so to speak. So you end up with something along those lines. It's like uh, one thing becomes popular and something else doesn't. It's never the same thing. Uh, it's we move from one thing to the next and I think that's what the cycle is. We just happen to move on a regular basis. If you look at bull markets versus bear markets, you will see um, that a bull market is always just statistically longer period of time. Seven years, uh, could be 13 years, but a bear market is short, sweet, and to the point. Um, 1929, the low is 1932. Uh, two to three years is, is max. So I think it is explainable from a human psychology standpoint that it takes us a lot longer to gain confidence in something versus um, we lose confidence very quickly in everything. <laughs> um, I mean, everybody, you know, there were all these people cheering for Biden, you know, yeah, you know, whatever. And then all of a sudden, you know, if, you know, he's got the lowest poll ratings, I think, of any president in history, you know. So, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's just the way it is. The gold got me interested in the sense of um, commodities. And um, I suppose I was, you know, taken in by the, you know, the, the gold bug idea uh, back in the early 70s. The Bretton Woods collapsed in 71, et cetera. Um, but the uh, commodities were there, uh, but currency started trading. Walter Zengerly, who was a, um, <clears throat> a senior VP at the uh, uh, Franklin National Bank, which was the first bank that failed. And they failed because of a 10% move in the currency, uh, Italian lira. Uh, so I got called in for that. He says, you know, th this was a completely new thing. I mean, they didn't teach anything like this in school. It was always fixed exchange rates, etc. So now, all of a sudden, the world was on a floating exchange rate in 1971. I was trading and stuff. So he says, you know about this stuff. Would you come take a look at this? He was smart enough to realize that he thought it was a currency problem. After that, you know, anything to do with currency, I would get called in for various different... Um, Banks. These were not things that were taught in school. Nobody knew about them. All right. This was all you had to learn, you know, um, on the street, basically. I was asked if I would then uh, manage a fund for Deutsche Bank in Australia. I had to get approval, who was going to be uh, the floor broker, all that. It was, it was quite draconian back then. I guess I, I really ended up being the largest advisor on foreign exchange in the world. And I didn't realize why. In 1985, we were going to open our, off, our first office in Europe. So I had clients from 
all over the world uh, at that stage that were coming in. And so I went to lunch with uh, uh, the head of one of the Swiss banks in, in, um, in Geneva. And we went to lunch and I had a list of like uh, European names, like, because I knew they were, there was anti-Americanism in Europe back then. And uh, so I said, we had, I came up with a list of names like European advisors or something. And um, he kind of laughed and he said to me, he says, name one European analyst. And I couldn't. After um, World War II, all the European currencies were basically zero. So they were starting out over. So the politicians used the currency as uh, validity that, see, the Deutsche Mark's up two cents against the dollar, so that proves I've done a good job sort of thing. Whereas in America, no president could run and say, vote for me, the dollar's up against the Mexican peso, you know? Um, you want me to just pick her up and put her over here? Okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> What they did was that if the currency in Europe became more of a, um, a political tool. So even to this day, if you're an analyst in one of the banks, uh, you can't stand up and say, oh, the euro is going to crash. The ECB would be on the phone and say, hey, fire that guy. At that meeting, when I was embarrassed because I couldn't name any European analysts that I had heard of, and he laughed and he says, there are none. They still teach fixed exchange rate systems in, in school. I mean, we've been on a floating exchange rate system since 1971. They don't teach hedging. They don't teach any of this stuff. I don't know. It's just been institutionalized. And they still teach the old theories. Oh, you increase your money supply. Central banks use it. If we increase the money supply, <clears throat> that will be inflationary. Well, the ECB did that since 2014, lowered interest rates to negative, and there was no inflation until COVID. So what's wrong with this idea that you could just lower interest rates and boost the economy? It's a theory that, the, that Keynes put together back in the Great Depression. And <clears throat> Herbert Hoover was running balanced budgets back then. So he was arguing you should run a deficit to help compensate for the decline in the demand, all right? And then politicians took that as the okay to have deficits and they never stopped. So they take what they want. Back then, Keynes's idea, uh, it made at least sense. It was, you know, we will raise interest rates to stop people from, you know, borrowing and spending and we'll lower interest rates to stimulate. The government wasn't the biggest wasn't the biggest borrower. Today they're the biggest borrower. So none of these things work because if they raise interest rates to stop us from spending, does politicians say, "Oh, gee, we should spend less because that's what the central bank wants"? No, um, they just their budgets expand. Just look at at Biden. He's blaming everybody under the sun for inflation but himself. Uh, oh, it's Putin's inflation. Uh, that's the Fed's job. Uh, it, it, this goes back to that theory that we can spend whatever we want, but if the Fed is the one supposed to neutralize it, none of these theories work anymore. Um, they were made during the Great Depression when governments had a balanced budget, uh, and it's no longer applicable. Look, we're in need of a big reform economically. There, there's going to be one. Um, they're trying to uh, create something different. You have uh, Klaus Schwab putting out his thing about, you know, you own nothing and be happy. That is a clever piece of propaganda. People think, oh, he was, he's communist. So, well, it's, what he's really saying is that the governments can no longer continue this system. They're going to default. But if they default, that wipes out all the pension funds. So everybody's going to be down there with pitchforks storming the 
Congress and, and uh, parliaments and dragging them out and if not hanging them on the streets, you know. Uh, so saying that you own nothing and you'll be happy, is, you're trying to make it sound like, oh, you have all this debt, terrible, we're going to try and help you. We'll eliminate all debt. So we'll forgive all your student loans, car loans, mortgages, whatever, because we care about you. But in the fact, that's, they're doing it because that's what, they're defaulting. Uh, so it, it's a clever uh, shell game in the sense that they know this is coming to an end. So you think they were going to, they're going to try to pull some debt, big debt forgiveness game? Um, that's what Schwab is pushing. The difference between my solutions, which I basically said we would take the debt, <clears throat> we would uh, convert it to like coupons, uh, and then you would have to take the coupon and it's, it's valid to like buy domestic equities. Uh, what that would do would be um, it would create jobs and provide financing for every guy that ever dreamed of going public. It's a debt to equity swap that you would do if a company's in trouble. Um, so I would take their debt, swap it out to equity, but it's the government, so you don't have equity in the government. So you convert it to coupons, and then you take this coupon down to your brokerage house, and you say, okay, fine, uh, here's $2,000. You're creating a coupon, which is then, you then can use the coupon only to buy equity. So it's, it's, you're converting it to cash in a way. It's a kind of cash, conditional cash. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then that wipes out the debt. Um, Schwab's way is you default on the debt, uh, and you get more power, uh, but in order to do that, we have to, to uh, wipe out everybody else's debts and pretend we did it for them. My view is they would lose power. They no longer um, can run for office and say, vote for me, I'll give you three lollipops and a free car. Um, you can't do that without deficit spending. If the government can no longer borrow, they, they can't do that. Uh, income tax is uh, absolutely ridiculous. Uh, it, it, it was forbidden in the Constitution as a direct tax because it forces you to um, inform the government of everything you do. It makes you a slave, doesn't it? I mean, you're Pretty much, you're an economic slave, that's it. Uh, Whereas a retail sales tax, <clears throat> it doesn't matter who you are, or whatever, you go to the store, you buy something, you pay the tax. Um, so that's an indirect tax. That's the way taxation should have been. That's what the Constitution was all about, no direct taxation. And then, you know, um, so, oh, the rich aren't paying, you know, Hey, if the rich guy wants to go buy his Ferrari, he does, can't take a lawyer with him to get out of the tax. <laughs> you know? uh, everybody pays. Whatever he's spending pays. Um, you know, if you bought a house, there should be a sales tax on it, and, and it's incorporated into the, into the mortgage rate. Um, that would be more than enough uh, revenue to keep the government going. The problem is, it, back in 1970, if you took an e-bond and you went down to the bank and you said, here, I don't want to cash it in. It's a hundred dollar bond. I want to borrow $80 against it. It was illegal. You, it was illegal to borrow against debt because that was the theory that if you borrowed rather than print, it was less inflationary. Um, but then after the flowing exchange rate system began, what happened was <clears throat> all of a sudden the debt was just cash that paid interest. So if you want to trade futures or something, you take you can buy T-bills and put the T-bills up as collateral. You couldn't do that before 1971. So now, instead of the debt, uh, it's less inflationary because you're not increasing the money supply, you do increase the money supply. So it creates the whole uh, facade of, of nonsense why central banks are out of control. 
central bank um, has no control over the spending. Uh, only the you know the the money supply that's it, but it has no control if the government you know creates a six trillion dollar deficit this year. That's bonds out in the market, and the banks use it as collateral, and and it's, it's you're still it's money that pays interest. That's all. Legally, let's say you found a hundred dollar bill in a parking lot, you're supposed to report that to the government. Oh, I found a hundred dollar bill. Here's your fifty bucks. Um, you know, there's been questions, what is income? Then they went after gift taxes. Uh, then inheritance, oh, the rich, they're just letting this money go off to their, their children, you know. You wiped out independent farmers. Um, the farmer basically died, and he had, let's say, you know, a thousand acres or whatever, and then he leaves it to the family and the kids, and oh, well, now that's worth a, you know, $10 million. Where's our tax on that? So then they had to sell land to pay the tax. Uh, so this is why you have corporate, you know, farming. I mean, a lot of the small farms, they, to pay the tax, they continue generation after generation. They just had to keep selling land. Um, you know, a, a small business that, a guy has built and he employs like 30 people and then all of a sudden he dies. Oh, we, where's our tax? The business is worth this. So now you got to fire people. Um, inheritance taxes is, you've paid taxes on whatever you earned your whole life. And now whatever's left, they want 40% of that. <laughs> we are slaves in the sense that if you went <clears throat> and you... Uh, earned something in Hong Kong. Uh, I earned uh, $10,000 in Hong Kong. Where's our cut? You have to pay uh, income tax on worldwide income. All right, so the, the old thing, oh, you're paying your fair share. Fair share of what? My expenses dom domestically? No, I'm a slave. Whatever I earn anywhere in the world, I have to pay. Um, this is what income tax is and why it's so, you know, um, draconian. You pay uh, value-added tax in, in, when you go to a trip on, into Europe. Then at the airport, you say, okay, here's my receipts, and they refund you back the tax. Why? Because you shouldn't be paying taxes to support the European system if you don't live there. What are you paying taxes for? Um, we don't do that. We tax worldwide income, period. You don't get anything back. <laughs> um, we own you. It's stamped on your butt when you were born. Uh, property of U.S. government, period. It's just in violet and, you know, you can't see it. Look, when I was a first start in business, you know, I started with $600. Um, I don't know if you could do that today. Uh, when I had offices in, in, uh, in New Jersey before I moved down, we had to have, uh, they, they put in some sort of law, we had to have some sort of liability insurance that if somebody walked into the office, slipped and fell, that they were covered. Well, when I looked at it, we were on the third floor. If you worked for me, you weren't covered, that's workman's comp. If you were like the mailman, you came in, that's workman's comp. I couldn't find anybody that would have been <laughs> eligible under this, but probably somebody's brother-in-law concocted this thing up, and that was it. We had con we were doing a conference in, in Philadelphia. We were going to have a conference at the convention center. Uh, then they said, well, I have to have terrorist insurance. I said, what's terrorist insurance? I, you know, oh, you have to cover our building, the city of Philadelphia, and the state. I called my insurance broker and I said, is there terrorist insurance? Never heard of it. So what, somebody's brother-in-law in Philadelphia created this one? I mean, why am I responsible for a terrorist attack for the whole state? Because I'm holding a conference in Philadelphia? I mean, it was just like, sorry, we're going to get someplace else. I mean, uh, it, it's just crazy. I mean, it, it's somebody 
that's the problem with republics. It's that somebody, they're always the most corrupt form of government. So what do you think is a better form? Or? It, it, it didn't direct democracy. Um, a lot of people don't understand um, why like women didn't have the right in, in Athens to vote. It was because only the head of the household voted. So he was like the representative of a congressman. He represented everybody who was in there, um, the wife, the kids, the, even the slaves, whatever. He would go down and vote for the house. All right. Um, so that was more of a direct democracy. Shall we go to war against Sparta? Yes or no? Um, whereas here, uh, they vote for, you know, you vote for me, and then they can start wars and do whatever they want with no uh, question about, you know, Americans, uh, do you want to go to war? No. Um, so that's always the situation. I mean, just look at Zelensky in, in Ukraine. Uh, you know, he, <clears throat> you look at what he ran on. Uh, he was going to end uh, the civil war with Russia and against, you know, corruption. You know, it's now come out that he's got well, been stashing well over, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, offshore, tax-free, and he's done nothing but wage war against Russia. Um, Henry Kissinger came out and said, resolve this, let them, you know, there was a Minsk agreement where Donbass was supposed to vote, and he's refused to allow them to vote. but. Historically, the, the east of the river was always, that was the Russian Empire, even before the USSR. So that's why you have Russians there. Um, I have friends on both sides. So I have friends in Kiev and I have friends that were in Donetsk. Uh, and I can tell you, if you ever brought a bottle of Russian vodka to a uh, dinner in, in Kiev, it was a huge insult. <laughs> uh, they hated the Russians. Uh, and likewise, you went to Donetsk and they hated the people in Kiev. I mean, the country should have been split. Simple as that. Um, but this is, you know, Zelensky's out there. We will not yield one inch. So as if this, this is, is the 18th century empire we're fighting over territory or something rather than people. I think the big difference between America and Europe is that, and Europe never forgets. And it's, it goes back centuries. But did, did the timing of this Russian uh, war kind of find suspicious to you? Like yes, it, 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 it was definitely instigated. There's no question about that. You can go online. Um, the Daily Caller reported the day before uh, Putin invaded, um, Zelensky stood up and said that they were going to uh, uh, install nuclear weapons as a defense against Russia. That was part of the Belgrade Agreement. Uh, most people don't realize, but uh, Ukraine had, was the third largest nuclear power in the world. Uh, the deal was they gave up their nuclear weapons. Russia took them back. NATO promised not to go in, and Russia promised not to go in as long as they remained neutral. The Biden administration sent over Harris to the Munich a security thing, which was February 20th. And, you know, again, you, you have idiots there, but somebody probably handed her a slip and said, you know, and she says, oh, you know, Ukraine should join NATO, which is exactly <laughs> violation of, of, of uh, the Belgrade Agreement. And then, you know, three days later, he stands up and says they're going to install nuclear weapons. Uh, Putin goes in the next day. Now, oh, he's evil. We did the same thing in Iraq. They didn't have any weapons of mass destruction, but under the same theory, oh, gee, they're going to be a nuclear power. We're going to go in and stop it. Yeah. So it, it, a lot of this is just seems to be propaganda and intentional, and I think that they need a war at this point just to hide the debt crisis. It's... I don't think we're going to have more than they can stretch it out maybe another couple of years. 2024 is going to be a, a, a watershed event, I think. 
Uh, it's not only when Biden's is up, is up, but Zelensky's up for election, the head of the EU's up for election, and Putin's up for election. Um, and so what, what is the debt? Could you explain what is the debt crisis right now? Um, <clears throat> basically that uh, you had the ECB lower interest rates to negative uh, in 2014. Uh, so eight years later, still negative, you wiped out all the pension funds. By law, they ha you know pension funds have to, in Europe, depend depending where they're at, but anywhere between 70% to 100% uh, government bonds. Like our so security system is 100% government bonds. Oh, to be safe. We don't want you to be risky money with stocks. How about that, you know? Uh, now you lower the interest rates to negative. So what do you do? You end up wiping out the pension funds that need 8% to break even. So that brings in their whole theory, oh, you know, <clears throat> uh, guaranteed basic income. What is that? It's really um, to effectively just uh, replace the pension funds. Because they're, they're the ones they've wiped out with their uh, rules and regulations. Uh, so it's, I don't know. We, we just seem to have the worst possible crop of politicians ever in human history uh, on a global scale. They can't sell debt. Okay, so that's the problem. Once you, the governments. Okay. Um, U.S. is still okay because our rates are higher. We never went negative. There's war in Europe, so the capital tends to come to the United States, just like World War I, World War II. Um, but that will only last for a short period of time, too. But Europe is an absolute basket case. Uh, it's uh, <clears throat> Maybe it can last another couple of years before you're talking about... You, you might as well just print the money, because nobody can buy your fictitious bonds other than the central bank. And what, why, why would a government issue debt and then borrow it if they could just print it themselves? Because we're back to that old theory. Gee, if we print, it's uh, inflationary. If we borrow, it's less. But isn't that just a lie to, to give the more influence to these bankers to then influence the government? Well, it, it's, it's from a different era. Like I said, yeah. before 1971, you couldn't borrow on the debt. But it wasn't ever true that the theory was always wrong, no? Well, the theory was maybe right at one point in time. You're yeah, talking yeah. about, you know, um, Austrian economics, etc. I mean, it was a different world back then. Uh -huh. You know, so if you borrowed, you weren't creating money. Okay, you couldn't use it to spend. But when you can take it and post it as collateral and borrow against it, it's money. It's authoritarian government. Uh, they want to control everything possible. Uh, that's what, um, I mean, you have even Pfizer coming out talking about putting a chip in a pill that would confirm that you took your medicine, you know. I mean, why these people want to turn us into absolute slaves is just, it's unbelievable. Uh, but it's to retain their power. They're so afraid of us revolting and there'll be a revolution and they're all thrown out. So it's them and their self-defense. Uh, that's really what you're dealing with. It's... Um, You've spent time with, with Schwab, haven't you? Or? Well, I was invited up to his movie when it debuted in New York. Uh, you know, I've shaken hands with him. I mean, it... Look, he's... Uh, Have you ever talked with him much? Or? No, not a lot, no. I mean, he's... I don't see anything to talk about. He's just an academic who's on the opposite side. Um, there's no point in me really talking to him. I was just asking another film, would I debate him? Sure, if you want me to debate him. But, you know, it's, it's not going to... He has his ideas and he's not going to change them. So why should... There's no point in even talking. You know, they say, we want to create more equity, and then they're only advocating things that just impoverish people and just wreak havoc on the economy. Oh, yeah, no, a lot of the... <laughs> he's not interested in... Uh, it's the inclusive capitalism, it, the Rothschilds... That that's all propaganda. Um, 
the, the same thing with, uh, you know, the Democrats saying, oh, any uh, reform on voting, oh, you're going to, you know, the, the blacks won't be able to vote. What black doesn't have ID? You know, um, you can't do anything. You can't get a job without, you can't collect social welfare or social security without ID. You can't get on a train without an ID. So you, I think they're really insulting the blacks and trying to make them sound like they're so like imbeciles and they just walk around going, da, you know, I mean, come on. Um, if they're going to have a job as an employer, I have to have proof that they're an American citizen. Otherwise, I get fined. How do I get that? Oh, I got no ID. Well, sorry, I can't hire you. Uh, so we're, we're, this is all propaganda. Um, the only people who wouldn't have ID are illegal aliens. Honestly, that's it. Any American, you can't possibly exist without some ID. And like, are, are, what do you think about this t total digitization of everything? That you know, Klaus Schwab saying you know crime will go to zero because everything will be monitored all at all times. And this, what, what do you, what do you think of this vision? It's nonsense, really. But I mean, if you look at um, just history. All right. Okay, fine. If you digitize all the money so that um, you can't pay the 13-year-old girl next door for babysitting. Um, so she goes, well, would you, you know, what would you like? Well, you know, I'll give you, I'll buy a dress for you or something, you know. You end up in a barter system. Uh, in, in, I think probably the best example is Japan. The emperor kept, uh, a new emperor would come in and he would devalue whatever the outstanding money was to 10% of his new money. Um, after a couple of these, the Japanese simply refused to accept Japanese coins. They used Chinese coins and they used bags of rice. Um, Japan uh, had lost the confidence of its people to the point that they no longer issued coins because nobody would accept them for 600 years. It wasn't until the Meiji period that coins were reintroduced. Um, so that's what will happen. Maybe we end up using uh, paper one or something, you know, uh, just as, you know, you know, you go overseas, there's been times, you know, they know you're an American. Well, if you give me American dollars, I'll, I'll give you a little bit off of whatever you're buying. You say you give them the dollars. They want the dollars as the hedge against their own currency. Um, Republic Bank, I mean, I think it was New York Magazine, they called it the money plane. They were show, shipping skids, $100 bills to Russia. 70% um, of the paper dollars in the United States circulate outside the country. They use them as hedges against their own, you know, their own governments. India, I mean, everywhere you go, Russia, they, dollars, you know, uh, they didn't want the ruble, the, you know, it, China, same thing. Well, what's the vision? Why, why is that being So they, it's, it's what I said um, over the years, that in dealing with governments for 40 years, I concluded uh, some very simple realizations. One is they will never admit a mistake. Uh, it's always us. They wouldn't have these deficits if we all paid our taxes. So it, it's always us. You had Yellen there testifying and they, they, you know, really she got a lot of flack. Oh, we're going to lower the reporting to $600 oh, to get the billionaires? Come on. Uh, I don't think billionaires are worried about $600. <laughs> uh, but if you bought a couch for your house, they're going to know. Um, but you think it's the government pushing this? Or I mean, are, are people like Schwab are talking about it? Well, Schwab is the one, um, they're pushing that agenda with all the governments. I mean, it, COVID, all this stuff, they were all basically um, doing that from, from Schwab. And, and I can tell you that um, I had heard rumors that COVID was coming, and that was in August of 99. Uh, by December, or, or 19, uh, by December, Bill Gates was dumping a bunch of his stock. 
January, I had information that Schwab was telling his friends a virus was coming. Uh, and then, you know, you get the Mars crash. Uh, so it, COVID was planned. It was way exaggerated. Uh, the same thing. Uh, it, it's, <clears throat> you don't lock down a whole economy for that. I think it was basically a, a trial run to see if they can control us. They didn't understand um, that they would disrupt the, the supply chain. And in the end, that sets off a huge wave of inflation that we now have. Um, so now what are they? Oh, it's Putin's fault <laughs> because he invaded uh, Ukraine. I mean, inflation started going up before Putin went in. I mean, um, I think he even made a comment recently, oh, now they even named the inflation after me. Um, this is all, you know, propaganda all the time. I mean, it's my concern about like, COVID and government getting involved is that I know them. They will never admit a mistake. So are they going to ever come out and say, oh, gee, so sorry. Um, I have one friend, who, they can't take any kind of a vaccine. Um, his grandkids, even a flu vaccine, gets, they get very sick. So you're going to mandate that everybody has to have a vaccine? That's, that's, we're not all the same. Some people doesn't bother. Other people, you know, get seriously ill. I mean, I, just right next door to me, the day that uh, the girl over there got vaccinated, um, they had ambulances in here within a day. She was rushed off to the hospital, almost died. Um, we're not all the same. Some people, no problem. Other people, you know, it, it's, it's a serious issue. Um, I had a, a friend in Philadelphia. He got vaccinated so he could travel. He got the blood clots from the vaccine. So now he can't travel. <laughs> uh, so it, it's just, you know, anytime government gets involved, be careful because they will not... Um, ever made a mistake. And as I said, after working with them for 40 years, and I'm talking about governments around the world, um, they're all the same. If I walked in tomorrow and I said, if we don't do this, 25 million people will die tomorrow. They go, eh, maybe you're wrong. They'd rather the people die. And from their perspective, they're maybe partially correct. If I was going to run for president and I said, vote for me because I saved your job, you're going to look at me and say, how did I know I would, lo I would lose my job? Um, so you wouldn't believe me. So it's better you lose your job and then I say, vote for me, I'll get the guy that did it. What should people understand about the cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin? Honestly, that's another fraud. <laughs> I, you know, I think that um, blockchain was invented by the government. Um, and, you know, and then they go, oh, well, it was invented by this Chinese guy. Nobody knows who he is or a Japanese guy or whatever. If somebody invented that uh, and is just silent, how much money could they have made on royalty rights? Uh, they'd be a billionaire, all right? Uh, so what is it with blockchain? That this Bitcoin or whatever, if I give you a hundred dollar bill, the government doesn't know where I got the hundred from. It's just between you and me. But if I give you a hundred in Bitcoin, they know with blockchain where I got it from. They can trace it all the way back. This is their ultimate dream. Uh, that ends, they can trace every person that ever handled that and make sure they got their taxes. Um, it's like more of a control. It's a complete control thing. And, and by allowing this uh, to go, and I, I've said this when they were starting, I said, look, this is uh, what, you know, governments do, they float a balloon. And to see if it's accepted. If it's accepted, then they go full in. 
So this, you know, Bitcoin, it was a balloon. That was it. Oh, this is great. Oh, you had people say, oh, Bitcoin's going to replace the dollar, you know, and, you know, they have no clue about what they're talking about. Basically, you put out that propaganda, and I think a lot of it was orchestrated by the government, and uh, you end up with people believing all this stuff, and then it makes it say, okay, fine, we're going to eliminate all paper money, and we're going to get these, and they're better, see, they're better. Uh, it's better for them, not for us, but um, so then you got, you know, they'll say, okay, well, every central bank's, you know, been fooling around with issuing their own digital currency, and then they'll go, well, we'll give you one of these for two of those. Um, and that's it, and they swap it all in. They float the balloon to see if everybody will accept it. Oh, isn't that pretty? Look at it. Uh, that sounds like a great idea. Uh, and then, you know, they come in for the kill. That's, that's basically what it is. The kill is the, they kill all the paper money. They, you're now into digital, and they get 100% of their taxes. You know, we've existed with coins uh, since the seventh century BC. Now all of a sudden, oh, they're they're just dangerous to handle money. Um, Have you heard from anybody, like any of your colleagues, that about the anything about the CBDCs or that Bitcoin was a scam to promote that? Or um, no, not really. They haven't come out directly and said said that it's like you know yeah no we're gonna um do our uh, swaps stuff like that it's got worse uh you can look at the um uh bank of england reports that they want uh even more control say okay fine and and they they use it to say oh well parent can give uh, the digital currency to their children and they can prevent them from buying chocolate bars, you know. So they want to be able to say, okay, fine, have codes in it that you can't use it for this, that, or the other thing. Programmable, restricted. Yeah, money. so then what? You know, oh, well, you can't uh, donate money to uh, a, the, the right wing. Uh, people or something like that. You know, it, it, once you get into that, they can ch control everything, and, and that's it. So, um, is that the goal? yeah, that is the goal. Um, then they think that they will um, survive. I mean, what I have heard from um, all those people, the academics, and that you know, on that side of the fence, is that. Uh, Marxism would have worked had they had the United States and Europe. So it only failed because we weren't in the, in the whole world wasn't in the system. Um, this one world government thing it sounds like a conspiracy theory, but it's not. It's um, you can Google it. I mean, you got George Soros out there saying, "Oh, Jing is bad and Putin." They think that if they get rid of both of them, then they can absorb the, those countries as well. Um, the, the whole thing is just, is, it's, it's very, you know, uh, anti-humanity. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> I've been fortunate, I, I, I've seen it all. I went behind the Berlin Wall before it fell. Um, a friend of mine had was born there. The, the day the wall went up, he happened to be walking. He was a little kid with his grandmother on the right side of the street, so he became American. But the rest of his family was trapped. So he wanted to go in to, get to see them, but he, went, he, he had heard rumors that if he went there and they found out he was born there, he'd, he'd be kidnapped. So I want to go with somebody that's really an American. I said, yeah, okay, fine. I'll go with you. I want to see what this stuff really is. I saw what it was really like. It was like she would uh, say, if anybody was close to us, oh, this is our government. They take such wonderful care of us. And as soon as everybody was away, they go, oh, they're no good. You know, um, every curse word you could possibly come up with, she would um, bout out. It, it's um, what... 
really creates things is imagination and curiosity. Without curiosity, um, nothing happens. Um, I saw that movie of Toast in New York with gold at $162. You now perk, you know, uh, my curiosity. How could that possibly be? Uh, we're in, yeah, in communism, you're not allowed to have any curiosity, no imagination. We're all the same and we're just like, you know, uh, drones. Are we moving towards that here? That's what they're trying to do and they don't understand. It is that very element of, of humanity which makes us um, advance. And they're trying to create the status quo. Uh, they want to keep, it's all about them keeping power, not losing anything. But, you know, revolutions, that's what they're about. When I was invited to Beijing after the um, Asian currency crisis, they took me off to a facility. Um, you would have thought I was the President of the United States in a motorcade and everything else. And I was like, well, where the heck am I going? And they took me to a, a, um, <clears throat> a military installation. There were th these three huge satellites on the roof. And um, here they were, I walked in, they had maybe about 300 people who were downloading everything from the internet. And I was taken into the back uh, and I was impressed the the Chinese were tracking absolutely everything in the economy, but they were not interfering. They were trying to understand it. And um, what happened? They showed me there were two hundred and forty nine varieties of tea. I had no idea there were that many <laughs> varieties of tea in China, but they were. And they didn't understand why one variety would be, say, a dollar here and five dollars someplace else. Uh, and I said, well, where's it at? And they said, well, it's here. I said, well, first thing you have is transportation costs. Yeah, they didn't understand. And they didn't even understand that. Because in, in communism, if it's a dollar here, it's got to be a dollar over there, even if it costs you ten dollars to get it there. Yeah. That's why it failed. Uh, and I... Uh, was impressed by the Chinese that they were studying it. They were allowing it all to happen and didn't interfere. Whereas in Russia, they went from communism to an oligarchy. So you want to open up a restaurant and compete with an oligarchy, your head's in the gutter the, you know, the next day. Uh, so it, 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 the corruption just took over in Russia, where that was not the case there in China. So China has boomed and became, it's, it will surpass the United States as the number one economy probably by 23. You talked a lot about this, this club that solicited you. Or, well, what, what do you mean by that? They all are on uh, the same trade. That's what was long-term capital management, why they, it collapsed like that because the hedge funds are on it, the bankers are on it. They think that if they're all on it and they push it, that they can manipulate the markets. Um, so it's not like uh, long-term capital was there by itself. Republic Bank, I mean, in, in even Browder's book, he, he said he lost 90% of his Hedge fund. I mean, I, I you know, uh, Saffer supposedly lost a billion. I mean, everybody they just lost all this money. Uh, that's the club. Uh, they all are on the same trade, and they think that they can push the market to what they want all the time. And the problem is, is that when it goes against them, they turned. And there's no bid because they're, they're the only ones. Some people were soliciting you to... Yeah, the, largely because uh, we became the largest uh, advisor 
uh, institutional advisor in the world. I mean, that was when I testified before Congress in, in 1996, um, right there in the record, we had uh, $3 trillion under contract. You were managing $3 trillion? Not managing, we were advising on advising over $3, trillion. Over three tri which the U.S. national debt at the time was six. Nobody had ever been that, had that level of, of yeah, so they were always trying to grab, get me to, to join them and if, and because when they, I would say Russia's going to They wouldn't you to lie collapse. to people about things or what? Pardon me? They wouldn't you to lie to people about things or what? Pretty much, yeah. To um, mislead the market or guide it? And they, because people, they, they judge others by themselves. They're paying bribes to the IMF and, and, and politicians to, um, in the case of long-term capital management, they were all bribing uh, the IMF to keep the loans going to Russia, and they're collecting on these GKOs 30, 40% interest. Because I would come out and say, listen, they're gonna, you know, it's gonna, uh, silver was a, 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 a classic one. Fibro, who was the big uh, broker for Buffett, walked across the ring, showed my guys, here's all the orders, join us. I don't join with those guys. I mean, I don't trust any of them. If you're gonna shake hands, you, not only just you better count your fingers, you better make sure you still got your arm. Um, <laughs> I think it was Mike Irish on the phone, at, on the floor, he goes, Marty, this is, they show me all these orders. I said, all right, fine, thanks. And they, then the guys from Republic, why don't you join us? Um, and then the head silver trader from AIG, he came, flew in. I knew um, Sir Alan Walters, who was Margaret Thatcher's personal advisor back when, and he, then he ended up being a board member at AIG. And so I got a phone call from Alan. He goes, hey, you know, Marty, I'm coming over to the States. Can we get together? I said, sure, Alan, come on over. And he brings in the head trader for AIG for silver. Why are you saying I'm manipulating? But I said, listen, I don't say who it is. All right. <clears throat> uh, they made the mistake of trying to shut me up. And they called the Wall Street Journal. And this analyst, this writer at the, the journal, he calls me, he goes, oh, well, are you saying silver's manipulated? I said, yeah, fine. Well, you know, um, he, very hostile. And, well, maybe it's you. I said, look, you know, I don't really give a shit what the hell you write, pal. I really don't care. Uh, and he goes, well, if it's being manipulated, tell me who. I said, fine, I'll tell you. Let me see if you print it. It's Warren Buffett. Oh, that's ridiculous. Warren Buffett doesn't uh, trade uh, commodities. I said, that's how much you know. So then he put it in the Wall Street Journal. That's the problem. I can say anything. I can write it on my blog. That's all right. All right. When it is in the Wall Street Journal, they have to act because uh, some politician might read it. Oh, hey, silver's being manipulated. Uh, have you looked at that? You know, so yeah. the CFTC calls me. All right, fine. I mean, they monitor everybody's positions. They know I had no position in silver. All right, well, where's it at? I said, look, you know, <clears throat> it's taking place in London, outside your jurisdiction. That gets their back up. Their back up. He goes, well, I'll, you know. That's not true. We can call it over there and have the Bank of England say, I, look, I don't want to argue. I said, fine, you're going to have to make the phone call. I hung up. Leave me alone. Uh, I don't have much patience for those <laughs> sorts of people. Then maybe a few hours later, I get a phone call from one of the brokers in London. Marty, the Bank of England has ordered all silver brokers in for a meeting in the morning. I said, oh, shit. I said, I guess the CFTC made the call. That night, Warren Buffett comes out. All right, I bought a billion dollars worth of silver. I'm not manipulating the market. It was a long term, you know, but, uh, because his name's going to come out the next day.
Because he was manipulating. Yeah, I mean, they, you know, long-term investment, he sold it out within a few months. What they were doing then, uh, they were buying the silver in New York, shipping it to London. So then the newspapers in the U.S. report the storage facilities, how much, oh, there's a drain on silver, look at this. Shortage of silver, prices are going to go up. Because they moved it over here. So then he pay a PR people to write that? Yeah, it's um, they got people in the press that, that they leak these stories to. I mean, yeah. uh, like I said, just Google it. And you got George Soros now saying, oh, Putin's got to be removed and Jing because the threats to society. He's in there with, um, they're all in there together. Uh, Soros's nephew, his name was in Epstein's black book. I mean, yeah. it's Ep who's Epstein? His girlfriend, uh, she's the daughter of, of Maxwell. Maxwell was the one that got caught up in the 91 thing and then suddenly uh, he got caught, basically lost, uh, I think it was over 200 million pounds from the pension fund um, and then before he's supposed to report to the Bank of England, I think the next day or a couple of days later, uh, he suddenly falls off his yacht and drowns. Mm -hmm. A guy that owns a big yacht but doesn't know how to swim. What America was, all right, and, and I've said this in meetings in Europe, all right, what made America great? It was <clears throat> the fact that uh, whoever was the last off the boat was discriminated against. Now, that might sound strange, but to get the job, you had to learn English. So, yes, the first generation was discriminated against, you know, Irish or whatever. Um, and, but the second generation, their kids all went to school, whatever. And so now you ask an American, what are you? Oh, I'm half Irish, half German, you know, whatever. You don't see that in Europe. Um, it's there's still very you know uh, segmented. It's so that's why a single currency Europe it was just a fallacy. Uh, what made America great was a single language. Now we are undermining that because they start teaching oh the Spanish oh well we'll teach them in Spanish. You're defeating what actually was it made the country great. Uh, I can't hire somebody that speaks Spanish if for English clients. I mean, what are they going to say? Que pasa? You know, um, you know, you wanted to get a job, you had to learn English. That was it, and that made the United States the melting pot. It was it was freedom. You know it. Um, you could dream of becoming whatever you wanted, uh, an astronaut, a football player, or whatever. That opportunity was there. In, in communism, uh, we're shorted. Uh, we need people to sweep the room. Oh, here, you're next. Uh, so it wasn't. Um, so you think that's gone or something? Yeah, it's it's great. It's they're. they're they don't understand what made America great. It is that freedom and um, not conformity. Uh, there, there's an, uh, actually, there's a good passage in a book on Churchill, uh, The Last uh, Lion. And it talks about um, what is a genius. It's very interesting. And all the studies on it said the genius was the person who had um, rebellious, a uh, nonconformist, uh, and would challenge the teacher. Teachers don't like geniuses because they want them to conform. So apparently Churchill was one of these uh, geniuses, and, and it has a passage in there listing of all the famous people, they were all basically geniuses, all had trouble with uh, indoctrination. Um, yeah. it, it, and 
you know, it is true. Uh, it, it's Einstein said that the same thing. You, you can't solve a problem with the same thinking that, that created it. Uh, you need to think out of the box. The conformist thinking makes you stupid in a way. Like it does. I mean, that was the problem with uh, Japan and, oh, I have to have the highest grade, but you have to, to do all this. You must be, uh, you had to conform. And uh, so they didn't, you know, they could replicate what we had, but you didn't have people coming up with ideas. Uh, innovation and that's the real essence of it I mean that's who we are as, as a race um, some people this nonsense of equality is wrong um, if you can pitch a, a football better than I can I mean why should I be a quarterback and you know just simply because I'm next in line uh, <laughs> It's just, it's absurd. We all have different talents. Um, some people are better at that and other people are, are better at, at mental things. It's, it's some people can draw and other people couldn't draw a, a straight line. Um, and it's beautiful too. It, it, yes, that's what makes humanity there. And, uh, you know, unfortunately people like Marx, uh, he reduced everything to material. Um, and he attributed nothing to humanity. So, oh, it's, they're exploiting, this guy's become rich because he's exploited labor. If it wasn't for Henry Ford envisioning the assembly line, cars would have never came down to $600 back then. Um, look how many jobs he created. Yes, he became rich. Okay, fine. But how many, he created the whole auto industry. So it said, it said freedom to express the individuality then. Huh? Yes, and, and then you have other, oh, he's evil because he's got money. You know, I mean, I grew up with a, a kid who, was, who turned out to be gay. When we were young, you know, we were playing football, he would rather play with the girls with the dolls. Did we understand what that meant at the time? No. Uh, did he? No. Uh, when he became a teenager, okay, fine, you know, I mean, this is all very, very destructive, I, you know, and dividing people for, you know, race, creed, sexual, whatever, you know, um, it's wrong. You're highlighting the differences rather than uh, we're all together in, in, in a team. Um, that's really what furthers civilization. The more civilization is effectively all these diverse groups coming together. And why do they come together? Because basically um, there's a benefit to everybody coming together. Maybe uh, I'm a I can hunt, but you, but you can... Um, I can hunt, but you can, you know, better how to plant, you know, corn and stuff. So, okay, fine, I, here, here's a, a rabbit and give me some corn, okay? Uh, we all have different talents. So that's what civilization is. That's what makes it work. Uh, all of that coming together. As soon as you start dividing it, oh, he's a farmer, and, or he's a hunter, he's this, he's that then you no longer work together. Civilization starts to fall apart, and that's part of the cycle. Um, you come together, I mean, just look at, at Rome. Rome reached the population of one million people in 180 uh, AD. That was the peak, Rome began to decline. When was the next time any city reached a million? not to London in, under Queen Victoria. So that's the dark age. You, you, you then uh, move out, you get you know, feudalism, you know, every little guy's got his little you know, castle and, and the peasants. 
will work the land around it, but they count on him because if somebody comes, they all run into the castle behind the, the wall. You know, it, you don't have a government to protect you anymore. It's that little feudal, you know, castle. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it's like breathing in and breathing out. And then what happens is, is then you end up with the economic decline and then you lost your job of this and you blame it on somebody else. Then you got civil wars. So, so the dis disintegration of the, these individual identities being, being promoted, that'll create this digressive economic depression, you think? Oh, absolutely. Um, in the 1845, um, I think it was, um, you had the Irish coming. Uh, to the United States. And there was a, a sovereign debt crisis in 18, you know, 40 states were defaulting and etc. Uh, and so the economy went into really severe hard times. And so then people, um, it started the <clears throat> nativism movement, uh, anti-immigrant, uh, and then there were gun battles on the, on the streets in Philadelphia in 1845. They were all blaming the Irish, uh, coming in, taking their jobs, uh, stuff like because they were, they were willing to work for less money than somebody else. You know, it was just. Um, I mean, there's you know you can look it up on, on the internet. It's uh, <clears throat> you then start blaming the immigrants. And it turned into actual gun battles uh, on the streets of Philadelphia. Uh, so economics is everything behind it. You disrupt the economy. You bring this thing down where we're headed. Um, inflation going up and the, the, you, you lose. We've lost even the... the fundamental due process of law. These things go throughout history. I mean, the last time was uh, a, a big revolution against monarchy. That was the American Revolution and the French Revolution. This time it will be against republics. You know, that uh, they're just the most corrupt form of government you can have. In favor of what? Hopefully, uh, you know, direct democracy. Uh, that's what I would like to see it go back to. There would be a risk that you go into authoritarianism or dictatorship type thing like that. Uh -huh. um, how did Hitler even come to power? It's because the French put on the, the reparation payments and broke uh, Germany to the point after World War I that they had nothing. But now with COVID, we've sort of seen that a similar economic state produced through self-inflicted measures. Yeah, it's, and I don't think that these politicians have really understood what they did. Um, I don't think they understood the, the implications of the supply chain, the implications of the they kind of got orders from the UN or IMF and then they're implementing that. But even them, they're, they're not, I've, I've have not met any of these people in government in 40 years. Uh, that look at the world dynamically and see how it's all connected. Um, you know, when they were forming G5, uh, I was called in, I, I said, this is crazy. You know, you, they just sold a third of the national debt to the Japanese. And now they stood up, oh, the dollar's too high. We're going to um, manipulate the dollar down 40%. I wrote to Reagan. You know, you look on my site, there's a two-page letter that it responded. I said, this is nuts. They don't understand, that, okay, fine, we'll lower the dollar by 40% and we'll be able to export more goods and create more jobs. Sounds nice. Okay. However, the Japanese bought a third of the national debt. Don't you think they're going to sell? Well, why? Because you're going to lower the value by 40%. Oh, really? Yes, really, you know. They don't, the stock market then crashes. Uh, everything's connected. And so what, what makes you think that the U.S. will kind of face such a challenge that it might 
break up? Or where would you ever get that idea that there'd be a, a split Just up? historically, it's what's going on. You see like the, the polarization between uh, Democrats and Republicans today. But does your computer show that? Or oh, yeah. How uh, does it articulate that kind of... Uh, that it's basically the 2032 is the end of six waves. Uh, and this is, we're at the same point as uh, the fall of monarchy, the fall of the Roman Republic. Uh, it's always the same amount of time. So this 2032 period is this? It's, yeah, it's... Um, this is the end of republics. It'll be some tectonic political... Yeah, and, and you can see it coming. I mean, it's already this... Um, I mean, what's happening uh, under the Biden administration and Austria and Germany, etc., uh, the Greens have gotten a hold of um, government. Now, they know that the tide can change against them. So what are they doing? They're deliberately trying to destroy as much capacity to produce fossil fuels as possible so that if they were to lose power, the other side will never get, be able to get it back. Uh, it, it's, it's absurd. I mean, yeah, they say, oh, alternatives, that's for Alternatives... If everybody had an electric car and you tried plugging in at the same time, do you really think the grid's going to stay tough? Um, and they're, they're not very good. I mean, my neighbor has two Teslas, and, you know, I think he realizes he's got a, a problem now because if there was a hurricane, you, what are you going to do? You can't get out of here more than two or 300 miles. That's not enough. Um, yeah, right. Uh, so it, you know, there's the gimmick, yeah. Yeah, it, it's, and then they go, oh, you'll be able to plug it in. Okay, you plug it in. It takes two hours to charge. You're going to stand out there in the middle of nowhere if you can find a place to plug it in. <laughs> um, look, that's if you have the fast chargers, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, fine. I mean, you know, they confuse pollution with. Uh, this climate change, I mean, uh, yeah, I lived in London in the 80s and the buses were using diesel and you had to hold your breath when you walked past them. It was horrible. Um, they're all cleaner now, that's fine. Uh, I mean, so there's a difference between pollution and this, this CO2 stuff. And it's, it's predicting a breakup of the U.S.? It's in oh, yeah, and breakup of Europe, too. Um, and then we go back to fragmentation. So and it, how do you reconcile that with this world government idea? Or? Well, they're trying. It doesn't mean that it, it says they're going to fail. Um, the, the program showing that? Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so what, what is it predicting? That this form of government that we have currently, which I call republicanism, uh -huh. uh, meaning that you vote for somebody uh, and then he can do whatever he wants. Uh, you know, he's supposed to be your representative, and that's nonsense. Uh, they only represent themselves. Um, and, I mean, I've worked with, with governments. I mean, I know you're the way it works. Your thing is predicting they'll shatter into... Yeah, I mean, they're not going to... <clears throat> it's a very lofty goal to get China and Russia, and everybody's going to be subservient to the United Nations. Come on. Um, <clears throat> just look at Congress. Do they ever 100% vote the same? No. <laughs> uh, you're not going to find that. Uh, um, this is this Marxist theory that we're all just robots and whatever, and, they can, and, you, know, and you got Klaus Schwab talking about putting chips in us. Uh, you know, hey, come on. Um, <laughs> so what do you uh, tell the average American who wants to be free and like, you know? That if you understand what's coming, all right, it, 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 people go, oh, you know, I'm pessimistic, whatever. It, look at it this way. Here comes my fist. I'm going to, and I'm telling you, I'm going to punch you in the face. Here it comes. Are you going to sit there and let me punch you? Or are you going to dodge, defend yourself? Isn't it better to know that something's coming <laughs> rather than just to sit there and like, let me punch you in the face?
Look, this is a period in time of dramatic change, uh, and that's what's happening. So what, what can the average guy in like Iowa do about this? Um, look, stockpile uh, food, uh, we're, we're in also, we're in a period of climate change, which is natural. Okay, it's not CO2 or any of this other kind of nonsense. Um, and it's been, you talk, you know, 8.6 years. Well, the, it's also fractal. It's 86 years exactly from the, the Dust Bowl. All right. It, uh, I published on our site the highest temperatures during the Dust Bowl, 112.5 degrees. Mm. We have not reached that yet. <laughs> okay. Um, and historically just from a cyclical perspective how long should it last probably until about 2024 that's how long the dust bowl actually um what's going on now it'll last till 2024 yeah it, it's like the dust bowl um we're matching back at that level of temperatures and things of this nature so those, oh, this is all CO2, climate, that's nonsense. It's happened before. Um, and back in the 1930s, before there were a lot of cars or CO2. You know, you have, um, look, the, the whole January 6th investigation, what was this about? This was about trying to blame Trump for trying to create an insurrection, all right? And that's why they keep calling it an insurrection, even though there was no guns there or whatever. Um, because in the Constitution, if somebody was, was involved in an insurrection, they're disqualified from being president. That's the whole purpose of all this January 6th stuff. They're afraid of Trump. And in all honesty, on both sides, when he was first elected, you know, there were Republicans that didn't like him. Why? Trump was a little naive uh, to think he'd stand up and say, we're going to, he's going to drain the swamp. The swamp is both sides. <laughs> it's not just one. Uh, so immediately you had them all getting their back up. You know, you had John McCain saying, I don't want him even, you know, speaking at my funeral. His hatred of Trump was so profound. Um, so, I mean, it's... I, you know, after Trump was elected, I was down there, was some, you know, oh, this is a fluke, whatever. I said, no, you, it's not a fluke. You don't understand. It, voting for Trump was a vote against you. <laughs> what do you mean? You know, they, there's no mirrors in Washington. Nobody ever wants to say, you know, they voted for Trump because he was not a career politician, not that he was this great, wonderful guy or on a white horse. <laughs> They, they voted for him because he was the one who was not a politician. That's why he won. Um, what, what do you think of DeSantis? Well, I met him, and I think he, that he's uh, much more in line with, like, Maggie Thatcher. I mean, it was somebody that uh, I didn't mind shaking hands with. Um, I flew over to Palm Beach to meet him, but... Um, the rest of, you know, I was asked if I would get involved in, in trying to get some guys from Washington that um, know me. They want me to get back into, so maybe, you know, you can talk to Trump and talk him out of running in 2024 and then maybe advise DeSantis. And I said, look, if I, you really want me to get in, I said, I'm going to tell DeSantis to stay right here in Florida. Thank you very much. Uh, and... Um, I said, because if he goes to Washington, you're going to eat him for lunch. That's what they did to Trump. Uh, people don't understand how it really works. It's, um, um, you know, I've said before, I, I was part of the vetting process uh, in selecting people to be president back in, you know, up until 1999. Uh, I would go meet with, uh, like, Governor of Oklahoma, et cetera. And that, I was asked, to, you know, uh, we want you to go down and meet with, with uh, uh, Bush Jr. 
But the process up to that point was, what do you think? Is he smart enough to, to handle, the, you know? I was there, they were to tell them how the world economy worked. And, but I was asked, to, do I think the, there's a light on? Does the guy understand it, all right? Uh, and then when I was asked to go down to Bush, meet with Bush Jr., they said, oh, this one's different. I said, what do you mean it's different? They said, oh, no, 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 he's really stupid. I said, what? Uh, why would you make somebody stupid president? And they said, he's got the name. At that point in time, uh, they asked me if I would be interested in being the chief economic advisor in the White House. I said, no, thank you. I said, I got a company. I'm not giving that up for some nonsense job for a couple of years. They pick the people in the cabinet. All right. Uh, I saw the movie Vice. Very nice. Not true. Bush did not pick Cheney. They picked Cheney. And I know who did it. So when I said if they would eat DeSantis for lunch, because they would do the same thing to him that they did to Trump. They put in all these people. And look at Bolton. Oh, he comes out testifying against Trump. Oh, he wants to take the people of Af out of Afghanistan. Trump was against war. I did go down to uh, Mar-a-Lago, uh, to a private dinner there, and he, he did impress me. He was the first leader that I ever encountered who actually cared about the people dying on the battlefield. And he said that he wanted to bring the troops back. He says, what are we there for? He was tired of writing letters to people, oh, your son died for what? He says, they've been fighting over borders for a thousand years. He says, what difference are we going to make? No. Bolton was against that. I mean, they, they always want world you know, dominance, and, and they, there isn't a war that they, they would ever reject. Trump was more like Kennedy against war. Uh, they took Kennedy out because he was against Vietnam War and all that stuff, and then they get, you get that. Trump was the same thing uh, when... Uh, I think it was uh, <clears throat> Iran shot down one of our drones or something, they wanted to invade, and he says, it was a drone, there was nobody on it. <laughs> so they use these things all the time. Around Trump, everybody in that cabinet was selected by them, not Trump. Who is them? It's basically the bureaucrats. Um, and if DeSantis goes down, it's the same thing. You know, and what Trump was told was that, well, you know, you're not a politician. You don't really know Washington. To, to instill confidence in your administration, we need people who are qualified, that are recognized, have been there for whatever, you know, the, the sales speech. And, and that's it. You know, it's the same nonsense over and over again. They run the ship. Uh, and so today, they got their dream. Look at Biden. You know, um, if I met with Biden, I'd probably have to bring a napkin to wipe the drool from his mouth. Uh, you know, he's pointless. He's just the, he's not the president. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of the, you know, the old uh, rap song, you know, will the real Slim Shady please stand up? <laughs> it, it's just replace it with the president, you know? I think that um, understand what's coming. If you understand what's coming, you can be prepared for it and you understand the solutions for it. This is civilization uh, collapsing. We get to rebuild it. Okay, and let's try and rebuild it this time that's not a republic uh, and we actually have control. Um, yes, it could be um, you know, like Athens that's just ahead of the household votes. But today with technology, uh, everybody could go online and, and vote. Do we invade Ukraine or do we not invade Ukraine? You know, I mean, why should these people be making decisions over what? And so he's paid them off to do things or or, you know, buy 200, you know, million more 
samples of vaccine than, than the population. Because, um, you know, somebody's getting kickbacks on the side. I mean, you know, it's time we take our countries back and, and knock off this, this nonsense. Uh, the opportunity's coming. They are collapsing. That's what uh, this whole debt crisis is about. And Schwab out there saying, you'll own nothing, you'll be happy. It's collapsing. They know that. This is them fighting, trying to hold power. All right, but they're not going to succeed. There's no way they're going to get Russia and China and everybody's going to, you know, goose step to whatever the United Nations says. <laughs> I mean, that's, it's a fantasy dream, not going to happen. <laughs>